ever since Roe v. Wade fell back in 2022, we knew that women's rights were going to be on the election. Um, and they have been ever since 2022 with the midterms. And it's been a referendum in this particular election season. So Florida, Ron DeSantis and them, these forced birther crystal fascists are really stomping on the freedom of speeches of these TV stations. So this article is in different publications, not just CNN, but Florida is threatening to prosecute TV stations over a, over an abortion rights ad. The FCC chief calls it dangerous. In a move that critics are calling a flagrant abuse of power, Florida's Department of Health is threatening to bring criminal charges against local TV stations airing a campaign ad to overturn the state's six weeks termination ban signed by Governor Ron DeSantis. The unusual warning from the Republican-controlled state agency prompted the Democratic chair of the Federal Com Communications Commission to step in on Tuesday. Jessica Rosen Warsaw, the FCC chair, said that stations should not be intimidated for airing political ads. You got to love these freedom people, huh? You got to love how they really only pick and choose which rights, um, who has which rights, right? You got to love it. The right of broadcasters to speak freely is rooted in the First Amendment, Rosen Warsaw said in the statement. Threats against broadcast stations for airing content that conflicts with government's views are dangerous and undermine the fundamental principle of free speech. The FCC's show of support for the stations is noteworthy given the federal agency controls broadcast station licenses across the country. The Florida Department of Health, however, cited local statutes in the cease and desist letters sent last week to WCJB in Gainesville and WFLA in Tampa. The, the threat from the health department underscores the intensity of the political battle over Amendment 4, a ballot measure that would enshrine some abortion rights in Florida's constitution. The state government led by DeSantis has campaigned aggressively against the amendment, including um, by running its own ads. The cease and desist letters from John Wilson, general counsel for the state health department, appear to be part of that campaign. The letters were first reported by the Orlando investigative journalist Jason Garcia and state news outlet Florida Politics. In the letters, Wilson targeted an ad produced by the group Floridians Protecting Freedom, which is behind the Yes on 4 campaign in, in favor of Smomorshan rights. The 30-second ad depicts a woman named Caroline who became pregnant with her second child after a brain cancer diagnosis. The doctors knew that if I did not end my pregnancy, I would lose my baby, I would lose my life, and my daughter would lose her mom. Florida has now banned some abortions even in cases like mine. The ad then encourages viewers to vote for the amendment this fall. Wilson's letter says it it's it is categorically false to claim that the current Florida law does not allow physicians to perform some abortions necessary to preserve the lives and health of pregnant women. Thus, he wrote, airing the ad is dangerous to the public's health and the health department could use its legal powers to initiate criminal proceedings. This is literally um, against the First Amendment. Floridians Protecting Freedom responded to Wilson's letter by calling it unconstitutional state action and a textbook example of government coercion that violates the First Amendment. Tuesday's statement from the FCC chair indicates that she feels the same way. The health department did not immediately respond to CNN's request for comment about this FCC re rebuke. The local stations did not respond to requests for comment, but both stations continued to air the ads on Tuesday. Good. But we still need to know and understand what these people are doing, what these Christo fascists are doing. They are literally trying to control what gets seen and heard. This is literally, you know, government trying to stomp on people's free speech. So y'all go ahead and weigh in. This article from Fortune is focusing on Britain's workforce. So this one is titled, Britain's workforce faces the crisis of its life as productivity has fallen to Victorian era lows and youth worklessness spikes. This sounds interesting. It sounds like the whole neat phenomenon is just really, really spreading. 
A staggering number of Brits either cannot work for health reasons or aren't working hard enough compared with their peers elsewhere in Europe and America. The rise of worklessness among youth coupled with trailing productivity promises to be among the biggest challenges facing the UK workforce. Productivity growth in the UK has flatlined since the global financial crisis and has now been reset to levels of growth not seen since the 1850s. A new report published by the Institute for um, Fiscal Studies, or IFS, and City highlighted. That also puts the country far behind its counterparts in Europe and America, which have advanced faster since setbacks such as COVID-19. The recent decline in potential output per worker in the UK is unprecedented since the late 19th century. The UK's economic performance over the past two decades is hard to describe as anything other than a policy failure. The report added that the country's proportion of high growth firms had dropped from 6% to 4% of the total in the past 10 years. Economic activity also impacts overall growth. IFS predicts that the UK's GDP is 6.1% short of its trajectory before the pandemic, lagging behind the Eurozone. And the people in the UK that follow me, you guys are going to have to weigh in. Does any of this have to do with Brexit and, um, you know, leaving the EU? Please weigh in because I am not really familiar with the ins and outs of how politics is impacting the GDP and the economic growth or lag or productivity. So please weigh in on that. In the 1990s and early 2000s, the UK's productivity growth was on par with others. But since the global financial crisis, nothing has been the same. If anything, things may have taken a turn for the worse with the shocks like the pandemic and the Ukraine war. The simmering productivity crisis occurs just as worklessness has spiked among younger Brits. The missing workers between the ages of 16 and 24 have been on the rise amid worsening youth health and a tight job market. Can labor fix Britain's broken workforce? The economic effects of these trends are important for the, la the new labor government to monitor ahead of a widely anticipated budget dominated by tax hike talks. Britain's performance has weakened on all accounts, whether that's in attracting foreign investment or boosting public spending to improve worker skills. A weaker economy hurts the resilience to big shocks in the future. Chancellor Rachel Reeves said in July that the country the newly elected government inherited was the worst since the Second World War. Her party blamed productivity failures on not enough investment in businesses, which has ultimately led to British households being poorer than German or French ones. Experts suggest that addressing productivity doesn't have a one-shot solution. It will take years of deliberate efforts to invest in skills and training, while also improving job opportunities and access to health care for the next generation of workers. The Bank of England's course with the interest rates will help determine what's in store for the economy. The Labor Party has promised to focus on sustainable growth. With the budget due to be announced on October 30th, it will have to iron out specific steps that will address productivity and worklessness to jumpstart economic growth. Okay, so this particular article talked about youth worklessness and was basically talking about youth, both male and female which is odd because Fortune, the exact same company, put out this article, and I did this article as well. Young British men are needs, not in employment, education, or training more than women. I'm just going to put it out here. All right, so right now it says, the number of young British men who are neither in work nor preparing for the world of work is at its highest in over 10 years, posing a major challenge to the economic ambitions of the new Labour government. For decades, far more women than men were classified as NEAT, not in education, employment, or training. Thanks to government efforts to get more women into the workforce after the financial crisis, the gap had closed by the time the pandemic struck in 2020. The question now for Prime Minister Keir Starmer is how to tackle the rising worklessness in the male population. 
Inactivity not only blights life chances, it represents a cost to the economy and lost potential output and tax revenue. At stake is Starmer's ambitious target to deliver the fastest sustained growth among advanced industrial economies. Meanwhile, a fresh light has been shown on a particular problem of male inactivity in the wake of anti-immigration riots that engulfed the UK just weeks after the July 4th general election. The challenge facing the new government was laid bare in official figures last month. They showed almost 460,000 18 to 24 year old men were neat, not in education and employment or training on average in the first half of the year, a rate more than uh, of more than 16%. The rate for women was 13%. Worryingly, almost 60% of male needs were inactive, meaning they were not even looking for work. That number has ri risen around 45% since 2019. By contrast, the figure for women has barely changed. All right, let me skip to this part. We see the rise in mental health issues being felt quite a lot by young men, says Laura Jane Rawlings, founder and chief executive officer of Youth Employment UK, which provides career support to young people. During education, young men tend to be more confident about the next steps, their skills, but with the reality of trying to find a job, that confidence seems to fall away um, from young boys quite quickly. Young women tend to feel the burden of financial responsibility a little bit more, maybe. So they'll take that job, they'll take the low pay, and they're likely to stick it out a little bit more. They will stick it out even if it is low pay. While women have made progress in the workplace thanks to corporate gender balance targets and flexible working, many young men have been left behind by globalization, uprooting jobs and values in male-dominated industrial hubs. The rise of far-right parties in, develop, in the developed world has been attributed to economic grievances with men twice as likely as their female peers to support the anti-immigration reform UK party, according to YouGov analysis of the election results. So even in the UK, uh, men are going more conservative and anti-immigration, blaming women and immigrants on their not um, their ability to not get a job. So this is a global phenomenon. Needs are a global phenomenon. And that first article where it's laying blame on all youth really needs to take a step back and look at the article that they did just last month. All right, y'all, chime in. Let me know what you think. Don't forget to like, comment, and share. When I saw the tumor on the MRI, my first thought was, am I gonna be able to see my daughter again? The doctors knew if I did not end my pregnancy, I would lose my baby, I would lose my life, and my daughter would lose her mom. Florida has now banned abortion, even in cases like mine. Amendment 4 is going to protect women like me. We have to vote yes. Now I want to talk about some findings that came out last month. Educators tend to view black girls more harshly. Here are the consequences. Oh, to be born black and female in this country, in this world. Schools discipline black girls more frequently and severely than their white peers, even for similar incidents, according to a federal report released Thursday. And remember, this was last month. Black girls are subjected to higher rates of exclusionary discipline, detention, suspicion, and expulsion than other students of color and white peers. And the largest gaps in discipline rates are between black and white girls, according to the Government Accountability Office's recent report, which examined the discipline disparities among girls in public schools. Students of color and those with disabilities tend to face higher rates of exclusionary discipline practices in schools, and they're more likely to be arrested if police officers are on campus. Attempts to address the disparities have occurred at the federal level, as researchers have said that punitive discipline can negatively impact school exp the school experience, graduation rates, and the likelihood of ending up in the criminal justice system. But advocates say the impact of disproportionate, um, disproportionality on girls has been largely understudied. G GAO researchers looked at data on infractions from the 2017 and 2018 school year from 36 states and saw that 
Even when accounting for the behavior that prompted discipline, Black girls were punished more frequently and more harshly than any other girls, said Jackie Nowitzki, the director of GAO's Education, Workforce, and Income Security Team. We have known for a long time that there have been dis, um, discipline disparities, but never before have we been able to factor in the behavior that prompted the discipline. It's not that girls are behaving differently. It's not that some girls are attending schools that just have higher discipline rates in general. We are seeing these differences, differences within schools. Black girls face more severe punishment for anything from disobedience to breaking school rules. The more severe and frequent punishments have eroded school culture for Black girls in turn. They are more likely than their peers to say they don't feel safe in schools, or more likely to say they fear being attacked and disagree that school handled discipline fairly, the report found. The GAO examined students' perception of safety and belonging by analyzing nationally representative survey data from 2017, 2019, and 2022 National Crime Victimization Surveys. This spring, the GAO also collected perspectives from 31 women aged 18 to 24 on their experiences with school discipline, although that information is not generalizable. They're girls. They're Black. So they have a lot that they are fighting when they're just trying to be teenagers, said Renita Brooks, a school counselor at Walnut Hills High School in Cincinnati, Ohio, who has studied discipline for Black girls. People feel like Black girls' strength is inherently impermeable, and that's not true. They see them as rock hard, but they are the ones who are actually more vulnerable because they have a lot more on their plate. Black girls are suspended up to five times the rate that white girls are, the report found, though black girls only made up 15% of school of girls enrolled in public schools in 2017 to 2018, they received almost half of the exclusionary discipline ac actions, the report says. That included 45% of out-of-school suspensions, 37% of in-school suspensions, and 43% of expulsions. Black girls with disabilities were suspended out of school at a 1.7 times the rate of black girls without disabilities and 3.6 times the rate of white girls with disabilities. Though other research has found that within racial groups, students with disabilities are disproportionately disciplined through exclusionary practices, that isn't always the case. According to the report, black girls and sometimes American Indian or a lack a, Alaska Native girls without disabilities experience higher rates of discipline than girls with disabilities of other races. GAO, GAO's review of research identified adultification, the perception that Black girls are older and more promiscuous than their peers, and colorism, bias against those with darker skin, as two factors contributing to why schools discipline Black girls more frequently and more severely. Other girls of color, American Indian, Alaska Native girls, multiracial girls, and Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander girls were disciplined disproportionately in some categories, but none as much as Black girls, according to the report. These kids are dropping out of school when they start having these higher exclusionary consequences. It just gets harder and harder to get back on track academically, and then they just kind of give up. For major infractions, when students are sent to an administrator, Roughly 42% of Black girls are estimated to receive exclusionary discipline in response, compared to an estimated 32% of white girls for the same behavior. Black girls are more likely to receive in and out of school suspension for the same behavior. For minor infractions, those behaviors managed by educators in the classroom, an estimated 16% of Black girls will see exclusionary discipline compared to 9% of white girls, the report says. The disproportionality holds true for subjective versus objective infractions, the GAO found. Subjective infractions, things like disobedience or disruptions, which are up to individual educators' discretion, saw disciplinary referrals for 18% of Black girls and 16% of American Indians, um, Alaska Native, compared to just 9% of white girls. 
In the case of objective infractions, something based on defined criteria like property damage or a technology violation, 16% of Black girls and 21% of American Indian or Alaska, Alaska Native girls will get disciplinary referrals compared to only 7% of white girls. Additionally, schools use exclusionary discipline practices for 41% of Black girls for incidents of this type of rule breaking compared to 30% for white girls. It's a longstanding problem, said Brian Jaffe, the director of children's programs for AASA, the school's superintendent's association. While students of color and white students misbehave at the same rates in areas of mandatory disciplines, things like alcohol and drug use or weapons offenses, when it comes to discretionary discipline, matters having to do with misbehavior, attitude, or defiance, proportion, disproportionality becomes more of a problem. One thing that school, schools and districts are doing and can do is to continue to clean up the language in their codes of conduct and be really clear and have really strong guidelines about what disciplinary behaviors merit which disciplinary actions to make sure they're applying everything fairly across the board, Jaffe said. Getting, word, getting rid of words like defiance, I think, is an important step because studies have shown that ad adults tend to find Black students to be more defiant defiant for whatever reasons. Like I said, being born Black and female in this country is a double whammy, and I'm glad that they are at least bringing and shedding light on this topic and showing data that backs it up. All right, y'all, go ahead, join the conversation. Let me know what you think about this one. Don't forget to like, comment, and share.